Hello everyone, this is Coach Carol and I'm delighted that you've decided to join us here today because we are making your family unforgettable. I am also absolutely thrilled to have Simon Davies with us today and he's got up very early this morning. He tells me he's got his coffee there ready, so that's good to know. <laughs> Hi Simon, thank you so much for agreeing to this. No, a complete pleasure. Amazing to see people spread from that big factory in Geraldton all the way over to Arizona. <laughs> Indeed, we have got people from all parts of the world today, from Scotland, from Eversham in UK, Arizona, Shropshire. Yes, I'm just having a look at them all. And a couple of us down here in the northern part of Victoria. So welcome to everybody. I'm just thrilled with the whole prospect of using We Are. And I know that you're here because you probably are too. Or if you're not yet, I think you will be at the end of this presentation. So we're going to go through an introduction to this marvellous software that Simon has developed with his team and get to know it a bit better. I'm going to work through some questions that I have for Simon and he's going to give us some demonstrations and so on. The very first thing that we want to know, Simon, is what is We Are and how is it different to any of the other platforms that we might use for our genealogy? Right, okay, short little question there. Yeah. Those of you who know me, worried now that I'll ramble on for a couple of hours, but I'll keep it tight. The big thing about We Are, or the, the difference is, I regard this as a family archive. And the objective here, and it, frankly, it's a selfish project. I, I set out to develop this with some friends because I needed it. And I was trying to do this, share my family history with my family. And what I realized was that we all tend to make a big one-off website or, or a big book and we present it to our family and they go like, oh, great, thank you very much. And it kind of sits on the shelf. Whereas what we found as we went, it's all an evolution and you guys are giving great feedback, which is helping us evolve it continually. If you actually create a space online for your family that's their archive and you get busy in it, chipping away, doing bits and pieces, your family is made aware of it bit by bit by bit. And even the ones that aren't interested, interested know they have a family archive that is a part of their family. And the system will gradually get to know through the data who's in the family, who's coming up in the family, and will start to prompt us to make sure that we invite the next generation to be a part of it. It's designed to basically be a place where we can slowly and joyfully work on the bits and pieces, release it to our family in the knowledge that over a period of time, we will get the best of what we've done, if not all of it, out into the open with our families and that it will find those people, whether it be this generation, next generation, or the generation after, who want to pick up the threads and really go for it on what we've discovered so far. It's about giving us a space to express our stuff, and then it's about survivability to get to those people down the line who will really appreciate it. Well, that is a great overview, and it really rings true for me as does for many people, because for me, it was an answer to all of my requests that I've been looking for for a long, long time, somewhere where I can have everything under the same roof. And that has become a little bit of a mantra for people who are following We Are, that we've got all the tools we like under this one roof. And so for me, it's become a game changer. And as Simon says, We Are preserving the past but we're creating a living interactive archive. I'm just fascinated with all the different facets of We Are and how I'm learning how to use it to share stories about my ancestors. So, Simon, the next question I have for you is one where you could probably share with us your screen, and I'll just make sure that you can share your screen. How can we explore We Are, maybe for that 30 days you offer, and how can we actually begin with our tree? 
Okay, let's set about setting up a tree. And first of all, I just want to say hello to Alfred down there because we've exchanged lots of emails and I just a quick wave. Hello. Okay, so I'm in my archive. And actually, as part of your last question about what our different approach, I'll quickly just make a note of this. I'm in my family's archive. So I've called it if I was a tree, I could call it whatever I would like. I've called it if I was a tree. As many people point out, it should be if I were a tree, but it just didn't quite trip off the tongue in the same way. I've logged into our family archive and you can see me in the middle, but I'm going to go to another tab where this is my cousin Tim has logged in. And you'll see as he logs into if I was a tree, he's the center of it. And this is really important. So your family comes in and they don't see Simon's website, him going on about his family history. They come into their archive. And if you look at all the families up here, these are the that's the paternal side of my cousin Tim, and that's the maternal side on the right there. When I log in back to my home screen, my families are separated into my paternal side, which is actually his maternal, because my father and his mother, brother and sister, and my maternal side. So I just wanted to show that quick difference. But in terms of getting going and setting up, I thought I'd have a bit of fun to set up a new tree. Let's do it here. And show you the sort of typical onboarding route that i mean most of you have done this already but i'm going to set up a private tree i'm going to import a jedcom i have one that i prepared earlier find the window uh, here it is so i i've been a folder here this is a demo family that i've got for today's session call it demo family tree i'm going to import it I'm going to nominate a home person. I know the person I want to be the home person is Agnes. It's not me. I'm going to upload now the JEDCOM and bam, I'm in. So this is where you arrive at, at the beginning. It's imported the JEDCOM. It's set up sections for each person. If I click on Agnes, this is her section. And it's set up sections for families. So if I look, there won't be many families here, Darlington there. So I've set up all the different families, it's just down there a bit more, but it's automatically broken up all the surnames into their own section, all the people into their own section. And you guys are, are familiar with this. And it will have given me, sorry, I'll go back to the home screen. And it will have given me a welcome screen that's that's really just a template. The, the standard welcome screen now is a series of videos showing you how to use each section of the, of the platform. And I'll be adding more to those actually. You can get them at the moment through help so the help is updated so you should find all of these in your help section i need to just add one in here i'm going to be doing that this week and i'm ready to go so that was uploading a jedcom and just for a bit of background i've got this book here and vanity autobiography written in the first part of the last century by this lady called agnes sills she lived in a big house on the hill near where i grew up and at the time, it was occupied by her two bachelor sons in their 80s. And we thought they were creepy, horrible people. They had this huge sort of garden, 20 acres odd, which was not touched at all. No gardens, nothing. And we as children used to creep in there and make camps and climb, you know, get up to the back window through the grass, commando style, et cetera, et cetera. And then about three years ago, came across this book. It's this vanity published book by this lady. And she goes through her whole life. And she came from quite an aristocratic family. Her father was a... Uh, friend of the Prime Minister, and it's all about her times in places like San Moritz and Egypt. And uh, so I couldn't help but researching her family tree. So I'm going to use her as an example as we, as we build out a story rather than the usual stuff that a lot of you have seen on, on the demo site. But that's how we upload a JEDCOM for those of you who aren't familiar. And I'm just going to go back to share screen. I think you want to go on to the next stage, Carol. I'll hand it back okay. to you. <laughs> We'll just pause for a second and see if there's any questions that are burning from the audience. And Jenny, if you just let us know if there's anything. Or if you're game, just unmute and ask the question in between. Nothing there at the moment. But I'm just wondering if everybody knows what a JetCom is. Is that something that everybody knows? Well, that's a good point. Yeah. Simon will explain. <laughs> So, well, for those who don't know what a JEDCOM is, sorry, that's an assumption. We have the Mormons to thank for JEDCOMs, actually. When you create a tree, the data structure that defines the relationships between people puts us in family units and it shows how we're interconnected. Any family tree software 
basically uses this data standard called GEDCOM. And you can download your family tree from any platform as a GEDCOM file and upload it to any platform as a GEDCOM file. So obviously that makes it incredibly powerful and useful to set out the basics of the family tree structure. The, re the reason we have the Mormons to thank for it is that one thing that generally happens with technology and things like data standards is that competing companies try and mess with them and vary them and to give themselves competitive advantage. I mean, just think about plugs on phones and computers and how they change, you know, like USB changes from one to another. The thing about the JEDCOM standard is because the Mormons are a charitable body trying to build up this database of people in the world, they've ensured that no one changes and varies it. And so it sticks as a standard, which makes it incredibly powerful for people like us. Thanks, Simon. That's a pretty good explanation. And one that I used when I first started using We Are, I immediately leapt over to my JEDCOM and got all the data in. But what if we don't have that? Could we start with We Are from scratch? Uh, yes, absolutely. So let's go back and have a look. So what I'll do just quickly is I'll create another tree. So let's create, and let's say I don't have a JEDCOM. So in this scenario, I'm into a you know, fairly predictable sort of tree builder. My name's Simon Davies, living, my date of birth, 1968. I'll put the 4th of September if any of you want to send me a card. That's myself. There I am. And it's basically giving me options to move about mad people. So I'll add, I'll call him Dave. It's not called Dave. But for, for today, he'll be Dave, Dave Davis. 19, great individual. I have my mother. So on and so forth. So you can see I'm starting to set people up and I can keep going. But the moment I say done, I need to give the tree a name. We have this rather kooky little name generator, but just for fun, but you probably want to change it. I'm not going to call it Speedy Agile Couscous. Let's just call it Davies. And there you can see I've started it. And anytime I want to extend the tree, I can either go tree edit and start adding people like that, or I can open a person. And you, you're probably familiar with it. I can have add father, add mother up here. All the relationships are on the right. If, if, on an individual's page, if I go to this edit top right, I can amend all sorts of relationships. So who am I now? I mean, so if I go to my grandfather, male, William, Davies, deceased, back in 1894. And he sadly left us back in 1981. Save individual. So those are the two ways of adding people. So that's starting a, a tree from scratch. I'll go back to the demo one though, which is a bit more interesting. So okay. It's just a couple of questions coming in. Mm -hmm. Is there anything specific about the construction and specifications of the JEDCOM? Uh, Marlene's had some errors in porting. The JEDCOM is a very old standard, quite quirky, and it has lots of nuances depending on which software platform you export it from. So it can literally create some different ways of training the same thing. One or two of them have glitches in how they output data. So for example, Roots Magic has a glitch in some of the notes output. And every now and again, we come across a glitch. We see these from time to time, and then we do workarounds in specific cases. So if you ever come across an issue with the JEDCOM you've exported, just let us know. And then we go in and investigate and make a sort of workaround to stop it messing up. Alfred just wants to know how fully can we handle all the free text notes and structured citations, occupations, etc. the exporters files? So we intend to be able to handle it fully. So we're working on it literally at the moment that we have all the citation fields, et cetera, et cetera, all ready to expose them. So as we work on exposing all the bits of information in it, they will start to appear. The interesting thing about sources and citations is that there are two approaches and different platforms output them in a slightly different sequence in terms of citation page and all that sort of stuff but we are absolutely doing that uh, that's great to know and from me simon i just wanted to ask you to reiterate the fact that the demo family tree that you've built is always available for us yes is that right Yes, do remember that. This is the demo that I'm building now. But if you go to your trees menu at the top right there, you can always go back to 
what is actually my family, except at my great grandfather's level, and have a good nosy around. You'll be able to see the art of everything that's possible in there. Yeah. At my family, should you be so inspired? Well, yes, because that was a great way to understand what we are does for us by seeing everything that you'd already put in place, especially the way you've handled the stories. But can you go on now to explore a little more about the interactivity, the type of archiving that you've got for us? What I thought I'd do is I'd take this demo tree we've got here and start adding some images to it. For me, the first thing to do is get some colour into the tree because it's factual, but it's already a bit grey. And one of the things that we are is about exposing all the stories and the rich media and all of that good stuff that brings it to life much more for our families rather than just a tree. We can start by, let's go, Agnes. Let's add a picture first from that book that I showed you earlier. We have a load of pictures. Let's go. Plus adding images. So I've just go a bit slower. Top left here, add image. We've got a little indicator there, but if you click anywhere in that space, it'll then pull up this dialogue which is for importing images, specifically in this case, a profile image, just to make that process a bit smoother. Here's Agnes. I'm going to drag her over there into that box. It automatically tags her surname and her first name. I'll explain about that 1752 in a minute, because I know that has confused some people. I go upload. It's going to offer me the opportunity to crop it, because remember, it's going to go onto the tree. And you see now immediately it's her profile section her section rather has a profile picture at top left and I've started to populate the tree. If I go to her husband, let's just quickly rattle along and add him, drag him over. See, it's got his surname, his name automatically tagged. Up he goes. Let's just pop his handsome face. There he is. He was a lecturer at Cambridge University in history, apparently. And then I've got their children. So let's go, let's go and get James. Now these children, the creepy old men that lived in the house that we used to creep around, except you can imagine how amazing, interesting it was to find pictures of them as children. We just regarded them as, you know, when you're like 10 years old, these creepy guys who live in this big house. Well, this is who they were when they were young. And it was amazing finding this book. Let's go and get the younger brother. So there were these two brothers. I'm going to add an image here. So I put his profile up. So the younger brother, Harry, and you'll notice I'm putting a picture into the profile section, which has two faces on it. But of course, because of the cropping, I can simply just crop around him. And this younger brother here, he was the creepiest of the lot because he had a stick and a limp and he would hobble around looking particularly sinister. In the book, you find out that age two, he fell down the stairs and was crippled for life, which was really sad. And then we've got her parents. So let's just quickly add her parents. Where are parents? See, I've teed it up here, James of Darlington. So we go plus. And I could click here and use the folder system, just find it directly that way. That's another way of doing it. Parents, James. Now this is the guy. He, you see again, it's automatically tagged. He was incredibly wealthy because he owned huge tracts of coal seams up in north of England, around Sheffield. So that was the source of his wealth. And as a result, he knobbed with all sorts of people around the world and sent his daughter suffered from bad asthma. And for the winter, he'd send her to Samaritz for the entire winter. <laughs> and then in the summer, he'd send her to Egypt. <laughs> and she has these amazing adventures that she went on. So you can see that the tree is just starting to look a bit more lively. So, yeah, so I've added those people in. So I just wanted to show adding people quickly and effectively. I think a lot of you have done this now. But if I go back to my family tree, and obviously I've got the blurred out, the living people, but you can see it's much more impactful if it's filled with people. And it was such an easy way to do that. It's the best system that I've found so far. If I go to... James, for example, when I go and look in his music section, because it automatically tags, that means I'm putting photos up there uh, and they're going into the right place. I'll just go back to his tree. If I go down to, so like here, Harry, the little lad who sadly was crippled. If I go to his media, here is that image. But of course, I'm going to open the image and click edit. And I'm going to add a tag for James, his brother, James Darlington Sills there. So now I know that I've got it in both places. So 
let's go back to his tree. So there he is, there his brother. And then we look at media. Now I've got both images there. So by tagging images correctly, you much more rapidly fill up content across the site. What we're wanting to happen is that everything is surfaced in all the places that's relevant to it. So that if our relatives are looking across the platform, that wherever they are, they find anything that's relevant to that part. I'm going to I'm going to upload more images now. So let's just having done the profile image, let's get into adding a load more images. They're from this book by this lady Agnes Darlington, married name Sills. I'm going to go to the Sills family name. I'm going to the Sills family section. You see, it's automatically split out this tree for the Sills family. And if I go to media, manage media, I'm going to drop in here a whole load of images that I know are broadly speaking relevant to the Sills family and that house that they lived in on the hill that I mentioned. So I can I can drag a whole load in. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to do what I would actually do. I've noticed these are quite big files, which is a bit unnecessary, to be honest. So I use something. So this is not strictly part of the... Uh, we, I'm going to use something that I use, which is a bulk image compressor. I'm going to put them up there and I'm going to reduce them by 50%. What I should have done is resized them before I started. Yeah, that's 168k now. Now I'm going to upload all these images. It will take a little bit because things need to upload into the cloud. So it's giving a little preview of all the images that I'm about to upload. I'm going to add media. See, it's auto tagged them to the Sills family because I did it from the Sills family section. Now, what's that number after a mechanism for identifying which Sills family? So as we get bigger trees, we can have the same surname legitimately multiple times for different family groupings. So I have Davies family quite a lot. And what it does is it's arbitrarily taken the earliest date you can find in that family grouping to give it a unique identifier. I've uploaded these images to the Sill family. Now, they're quite interesting. So I'm going to have a look at this one here. This is a 1953 aerial shot of this hill that I mentioned. So this, believe it or not, is a hill. And this rather grand area here is their house that, that they built on the hill. And we used to creep through all this garden here. And this is taken by the RAF. The RAF regularly yeah, took pictures of uh, the land across the country. And I, I think I found that on a Google Maps timeline thing. So that's a nice image to put there. And then in the garden, I mentioned that we, me and my friend used to rummage around when we were 10, 11, 12. We found in that garden a World War II air raid shelter. And we dug it out and made it into a, a camp. That's the actual entrance in the woods where we found it. Now, they're buried in the village. And this is the grave. The whole family. So all those people we talked about, this is Henry Hebb Sills, the husband. So I loaded it up into Sills. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start adding tabs so that they are... There's Henry Hebb there, so that they're linked to the, to the exact people that I want them to be linked to. So that's that guy linked up. And then we've got on the side, there's Agnes. So she's mentioned on the side. So I'll tag her. And on, let's have a look. I won't do all of them. But on this side here, this is the daughter who sadly died young. <laughs> Kathleen, she is. What else we got? At the back. Where's right the back? There's my dad. Say hi, dad. Uh, and here are the two brothers on the back. So we've got James Darlington. Oh, no, it's James Darlington Sills. There he is. And then we've got Henry Darlington Sills. That's him there. Update. Now those are starting to populate out into all the areas that they should be. So if I go back to the home screen and looked at, let's say, James. Now in his media section, he's also got the picture of the grave there. While I'm here, though, I'm going to change one thing about him. So James was known as Jim. And top right here is the edit where you control all the key crucial details to do with the person. And I'm going to put known as Jim. And what that will do is it will change the headline name for him, and it will also change him on the tree. So he's now Jim on the tree. And Henry, in actual fact was Harry, which I got to know from the book, <clears throat> not by knowing them personally, because they wouldn't have spoken to me in a kind manner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. This is really showing how important it is to plan ahead right. for where these images are going to go and who they're connected with 
So it saves time later. So thank you for showing us that. And we're moving on, I think, now to look in more detail. Now that we've got a tree, we understand the interactivity, we've got our images and so on, but we want to share our stories. So we're really looking for what are the tools in the site that allow us to share stories in one form or another. Okay. Well, I've got a, few, a couple of things to show you. I'll start with, I'm just going to make a quick biography of Agnes. Obviously, I've saved some text, so I won't subject you to watching me write it out. But if I go to someone's profile section, I can create a profile from scratch or I can pin an existing article. And just to explain what this is, if I had a whole load of articles already written, one of them might already suffice as a profile article for Agnes, and I could just pin it to this section. I'm going to start one from scratch, but just so that you know <clears throat> that's what that's about. So let's go create profile article. So I'm in the article editor. Because I'm creating her profile, it's automatically put her name at the top as a default, although I could edit it. At the bottom, you'll see spaces for tagging. Again, because I'm creating this in her section, it's tagged with her automatically and her birth name, Darlington. At the bottom, I've got an override thumbnail, and that's to do with when you have a list of articles, your first picture in your article might not square up perfectly, and you might want to override it with the thumbnail picture down bottom left. I'll show you that in a minute. So I need to get going. I need to add a block now, and I've got all these blocks to choose from, just simple text, text image, carousel, where you get a row of images where they can slide left and right, and then full width image row and that's where however many images you put it will always justify it to the left and right of the screen which is probably my favorite actually and then this family tree builder which is for making custom trees which we'll come to later but i'm just going to quickly make a text image block so you can see it's ready for the text here and it's ready for an image on the left so i'm going to click image and i'm going to choose the image that we had of agnes here that edit below is so you can add a caption. So I'll just say Agnes, nay, Darlington. And then we're going to put some text here. I took some passages from her book. Her book is called There is John Bull to Answer Yet. And <laughs> this is how she starts it. SOS from HMS Cambridge to HMS Great Britain. And if the latter will heave, da, 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 it's full of wonderful Victorian spiel, <laughs> is the best way to put it. But some of it undecipherable, but it's fascinating to listen to how she talks. I'm just going to copy that and paste it in here. There we go. And I'm going to make this part a title use any of these I'm going to use that style and notice so this is a little bit of a quirk at the moment that we will make better it will actually wrap underneath this photo even though you've written beyond the photo it's not ideal we just need to do some more work to make it wrap in edit mode as well but if you notice now when I click it's just there's an extra space there that it's picked up from the word document if I go publish you'll see that the text has actually wrapped underneath it. So apologies for having to put up with that in the short term. We will, the list of things that we want is obviously quite long and it's just a matter of prioritizing them. So I don't know if any of you found, if you grab that yes. bar down the middle there, you can change the size of the image, which is useful for various reasons. One, if you want to try and match with the length of text you've got, if I got rid of all of that text there, and I have in mind that I want to keep it in line. I might want it to wrap afterwards, but I might want it to try and line up so that it doesn't spill over like that. Started to create a profile there. And I think to me, this is the most common way I start. I like to start with an image on the left and text on the right. So you get some imagery in people's faces really quickly, and then I can move on later. That's a biography I've shown you. It does become just a straightforward article. So it exists as an article in its own right. It's just that it's been pinned. And, and by the way, the tags at the top here in the article are active. I can go from any tag I see to any section, click on that tag and it takes me to Agnes. Here's the profile image we talked about. And you can see it's pinned or unpinned. It's pinned to her profile. I created it there, but it is actually just a pinned article. I could unpin it and it still exists in the list of just general articles that are tagged to her. If I go back to profile, I can now go pin and existing. 
And there it is as one of the articles on the system. So I just go pin existing and I've pinned it there. So it's a little bit subtle, I know, but that's what the pinning is about. Uh, okay, so I'm going to come out of uh, this tree and I'm going to go and show you writing a more extensive article elsewhere, all to do with a four times great grandfather. Oh, actually, it's over in this tree. So I'm over in this tree over here. This is the one where I've logged in as my cousin. This is actually not our live servers. This is our staging servers, but it allows me to play with some existing data. I've bookmarked up here, I think. Yes, there. So I don't know if any of you have used bookmarks, but when I'm working on a particular area, a family or a person or whatever, I use the, I'll open my grandfather here. You'll see that little bookmark icon there. If I click bookmark, he's now added up into the bookmarks, which is a really useful way of getting back to where I'm working quickly. So I'm going to go to James Ariel. Here he is, and here's his family. And I've set this all up so that I can sort of do a relatively quick but rich demo. Okay, so I'm in this article. I'm going to create this article under James Ariel. Now, James Ariel was my four times great grandfather, I think. And yeah, here we are. So he, I discovered very recently, this was a bit of very recent research. He is was a watchmaker. And in fact, I'm going to create a space to write a piece about him, but I'm also going to immediately below here put, well, it's a carousel block. I'm going to make it into full width block. You see this menu. I'm in the carousel block here, top left menu. I'm going to convert that to a full width. Whatever image goes in here or images will go to the full width of the screen. And I'm going to put in these three fabulous images I found. I load up one image, tag, to James, and then I'm going to load up the second image. You see, it's gone full width, which obviously, if I was just using this image, I wouldn't do that because it's too big. But as I add more images, and the ratio of the combined ratio becomes more landscape, shall we say, it'll start to spread out. And then I've got one more. I'm clicking the little plus sign as I as I move the mount the cursor over the image. It changes. You see those little plus. I can put it in between, but I, if I click that one, it would actually go in between the two images. I've got one final image and it goes. And there, though I found these online just by searching. I think they were on some auction. I can't find them anymore, but they're signed James Ariel. So these are watches that he made and he was active from 1793 to 1828, I think it was. <laughs> so I'm adding in those images, I think. I've got some article text up here. Oh, here we go, yeah. So I was I was basically laying it out so that I could do this quickly for you guys. I put in Word what I'm going to do. Here's an image here. I don't think I've saved that. Uh, save picture as uh, watch. I think I'd fail to have enough old okay, article. Okay, so now I've got that image. So I, I'm going to go and that was the image there. So I'm going to drag that in. So this is from the Pigott's Trade Journal for 1822, I think it is. But that shows him, James Ariel. And that's where I found out he lived at 10 Wilderness Row. Let's find it. So I'm going to take the first bunch of text I got here. I'm going to paste it in. So this is a bit of text that talks about James. And it's introducing the fact that I live in London and I desperately wanted to have find ancestors in London. And it took me a long time, but eventually I found this ancestor in London. I was very thrilled. And it turned out to be a walk around the corner from my daughter's school. And it's next to a place called the Charter House. And the Charter House is this old, huge Tudor home. But originally it was a Carthusian monastery. Apparently Charter House means Carthusian, not a Carthusian monastery. But Henry VIII, of course, dissolved it, and it then became a Tudor home to one of the Howard family. You remember the Howard family? Catherine Howard was married to Henry VIII and had her head chopped off. And this particular Howard who lived there, he was in prison there under home arrest for 10 years because Elizabeth suspected him of plotting with Mary, Queen of Scots, which he did. And they found out because there was a note hidden under a doormat with a code on it that showed that he was guilty and had, had his head chopped off. He made good use of the time before he lost his head to build out this wonderful place, the Charter House. And my ancestor's home and watch place was immediately opposite the Charter House. So therefore it becomes of interest to me. 
And what I want to show you here is this is the Wikipedia page. I'm going to copy the URL at the top there. I've just highlighted it and gone control C. And I'm going to take the word chart house and highlight it in the article I'm writing. And then up here, I'm going to use the little link symbol, click link. And you'll see there it says web page. It's got the description text that I highlighted in the article. And then now it's going to say, what do I want to link that to? And so I've now linked that to the chart house. In that space, they have St. Bartholomew's, St. Bart's basically, which is a teaching hospital of long standing. And it's going to be very relevant to my story. So again, I take that link and I go back and I'm going to add a link for that too. And there we go. So I'm starting to build that story. There's some more information I've put here about the chart house. It was originally a black death pit as well. That obviously makes it quite interesting. And I, I suppose the bigger point that I'm making here is that in writing up our family histories, one thing I particularly adore, and I'm sure lots of you do too, is actually looking at the places and the pieces immediately around the, the person that you're investigating often it's more interesting than the actual ancestor you're looking into in their own right but just bringing to his story to life by describing what's around him so he lives in wilderness row he makes watches and i'm going to put in here another image and what i'm going to put in this time if i've got it lined up is there it is okay so let's so i managed to find a picture of Wilderness Row. So this is where he was. Okay. So he was in Wilderness Row. One of he's one of those. And he's making these watches in one of those buildings. And he's living opposite this this place here, the Carthusian monastery. And I can put it up again. Just trying to remember what images I've got. I'm gonna go and add an image. You can build columns of images. I'm gonna add one below here and drag in this picture of the chart house so there it is that's the chart house itself that drawing is in the lifetime of my four times great grandfather which is interesting to note i think i've got some more text to add in below here yes so the thing that i was rather tickled to find out about let's put some of that up there just working on my spacing the thing i was rather thrilled to find out about this building that he lived in was that I think the second one, this one here, the author William Thackeray lived there, 1822 to 1824. Now, William Thackeray wrote the book Vanity Fair. And for those who don't know, Vanity Fair, he was slightly poking fun at the society of the time and it's sort of snobbery. And he took it from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, because in Pilgrim's Progress, the pilgrims come to a town called Vanity, where there was a perpetual, never-ending fair for people who are... I don't know, too much into worldly goods, so too materialistic and selfish. And so that, anyway, although that has absolutely nothing to do with my ancestor, particularly, and I'm not descended from William Thackeray, he lived there 1822 to 24. So he was literally a neighbor of my four times great grandfather. And I like to think that he bought one of my grandfather's watches. I'll never know whether it was true or not, but I'm going to live with that pleasant thought. <laughs> That's fair enough. I like the way that you're giving provenance to your story through historical context. And I think it's helping us learn another way to share a story with different things that you've researched in the background. So let's just finish up with this one. Let's go add in the map. That's the chart house down here. So he lived up here with those houses we just saw, looking across to the charter house. One crucial thing I want to do now, though, is I just want to make a family tree. So I need to give him context for my family. When they come and have a look, I'm going to create what we call a subtree. So you can pick people, anyone in your family tree. I'm going to choose just the children. I'm not going to go into the spouses. And then I'm going to create the subtree. Now, that then sits within your article, and it gives a context for all the people involved. And it directly links through to their section. So if I'd been writing more about each individual, well, I'll just publish it so that we can see. And then I'll open it. Oh, I didn't give it a title. Did I? James. Oh, I'm not ready. Let's just that for now. 
Yeah, so here, so this is in the actual article. And I, if I click James there, I'll go through to James. So and I'll go into research recollections again. That's where the article is. So those are live. And this was one of the key reasons for wanting to make the platform in the first place. To me, it was all about how do I make family section trees, individual trees, and these subtrees as an indexing background to these articles and photos and videos and everything else that I had that I felt you just don't find anywhere. And this was a crucial part of what we wanted to do. So anyway, I've described all these people and that there is my three times great grandmother, Mary. And the reason I mentioned St. Bart's Medical School being on the site of a charter house here, it's just across the road from where young Mary grew up and became a teenager, young adult. Remember here is a medical school she married a guy called Thomas Peter from Cornwall, who was training to be a surgeon in 1818 to 1824, I think it was. So obviously you can imagine he was a student across the road. He might have gone into this watch shop, seen this pretty young Marianne P Ariel, and eventually ends up marrying her and stealing her back to Cornwall, where he worked as a surgeon in St. Allstall until he died in 1859, it says, of exhaustion. <laughs> that sort of rounds up uh, and obviously a bit more time I would go and complete that if my, my family's actual archive and if I go into research and recollections oh well, here's one I'm working on at the moment but that's uh, so here's the actual article I wrote out so if you wanted to share that to the public what would you do yeah. next okay I just so talk about them getting married in St Martin in the Fields there's that family and then I go I go through each son because they all have an interesting story some of them became watchmakers like their father trying to track down their weddings and then one of them became a publican i haven't written this up yet but i found an old image of his pub and then here's my great great grandmother and, and in the more extended subtree i've shown a few more people and i've linked it down to me so that people can get a better view of how we're interconnected to them. And at the bottom here, actually, I've got sources. So I didn't show you adding sources, but I've added lots of sources, of, especially of original documents. So I'm not overloading it with documents. So some are good, because there's something lovely about documents, aren't there? I think we'd all agree. But I think for our family, if we were just put, uh, there's 14 sources here, which are pretty much all documents. If you just go document, 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 I think that gets a bit too much, in my opinion. Yeah, and that's how I've chosen to break them up. What's next? <laughs> uh, sharing the articles with the public. Oh, yeah. I wanted to do that. Okay, so as you know, you can set your archive to be public or private. If it's public, then like mine is here, and anyone can come in. It's just that they won't see living people or living people's sections. And I can click share. So at the top of every article and photo, etc. There's there's a share button. I can copy the link. I can make an embed link for bloggers. I can share it to these other platforms. But generally speaking, I would do copy a link and paste it into a Facebook group, an email, anywhere that I wanted to expose it, Twitter, anywhere I want to expose it. And if you put it on social media, for example, it will it will generate a preview image from the first image in the story. So in this case, this one here. So it's worth remembering which image it's going to pick up when you share it. If your tree is private, you can still share. And this is came from many of you who said, I do want to share, actually, because if it's a piece of history, I'm not so sensitive about that one thing. I want to be able to make my choice to override and share one piece. The difference will be that where, if someone accesses this article, say, if it's private, then none of the links will work back into the archive. Whereas if it's public and it's not going to someone living, the links will still get you back into the archive. I want to allow people in and they can go and have a, a rummage around and other people don't, and that, that's simply a choice. So that's the ethos behind sharing. You can see here, there's a button here where I could actually decide to make this article private anyway. So I'm public. If there's something specifically I want to be private, I will set it as private within that public context. And I, probably the best example there is if I go to occasions. So myself and my family, we put a lot of current stuff that's going on because it's a continuation of the family's archive. It's really the family's repository for their lives as well as those that have gone before us. So this was a holiday that some of you I've shown to already, but with my son where he wanted to go on a camper van holiday ever since he was little. And we went to Barcelona and we hired a camper van, drove up the coast. There he is in, in the camper van. Had a great time. 
And I have, it's going to edit. You can see there, I, it's private. I've set it to private. So yeah. I don't want that one. Oh, sorry, it's up the top here anyway. Up the, I don't want people to see that one versus that story about James Ariel, who was alive in you know, 1793 when Mary Antoinette had her head chopped off. I think that's far enough back that he, he won't get upset with me. <laughs> So there's lots of ways we can actually share what we've built within We Are, and we won't have time to cover all of that today because we're already at the top of the hour again. It just goes so quickly. But I'm just wondering, Simon, if there's something that you need to tell us about the sharing aspect before you move on to that final question of mine, which is about how would you summarise the features that we've covered today and what is yet to come? Because there's been a couple of questions about what's new. Sharing from private only works at the moment on articles, but we're going to expand that to more content types, images, and in terms of and including the latest feature, which I think many of you will have seen, which is the documents feature. So this is literally a week old. I probably should have shown it actually. It's a fabulous way of sharing and capturing documents and so we, we recognize the need to share that just quickly i'll show it to you oh this is james ariel's will this is the same guy in that article that i just wrote and i've transcribed his will alongside which had some very useful information in it actually so that's that's one of the latest features we are about to release the blogging feature so anyone who wants to blog as well you'll see up here it says blogs i can create as many blogs as I want. I've started creating one very tentatively. I've written I've written one post. I, if I open it, you'll see it's separate. It creates a public blog access point. Basically, the thinking behind with this is that blogging is not really a very perfect way of, of capturing your family history because you create a long timeline that disappears forever. If you want to look into a person or a family, it clearly surfaces stuff appropriately but people like to blog and it's more of a broadcast channel and discussion piece so we've created the ability to link the two so i'm going to create a blog post but i'm going to link it to and it says pick a tree so i'm going to choose I mean, let's choose let's choose the demo that i just made so this is that one with agnes sills that we just had now i can actually tag it so i'm going to tag it to the darlington family and i'm going to tag it to agnes and I'm going to start writing an article. I can now access all the images in that, that family archive. So I've tagged it to Agnes, stick a picture of Agnes. Just type a load of stuff about Agnes. Agnes. And let's publish that. So this is a blog article. So I've just created a blog article. If I open the blog, so this is now opening a totally public blog, completely separate. That's the background I've chosen. There's what I've just written. It should be having that image there, but that's why it's not released yet. The last last minute glitch has been ironed out, but it should probably be out this week, actually. I've written an article about, really more about why we started We Are and some of its principles. A question but... about blogs. Jenny's asking, will we be able to have people follow that blog? Yes. So we need to make that. So that's in the feature list, but uh, like next up really is follow yeah. and comment on the blog. So that's a coming soon feature. You've got unpublished posts. That's me. I'm very, and then published. In terms, going back to the trees. So I've got several trees there, but going back to my tree family archive, we'll be making features forever, but probably the big one we want to embrace next is mapping. So we have lots of plans for mapping. So a location database so that, and in actual fact, our GEDCOMs come packed full of location data, which we just haven't exposed it yet. The trick being that ultimately you need to distill locations down to lat longs and store all those lat longs against whether it be an article or a, a building you're writing about or whatever. What we want to do is, yes, you can show a map, but do things like 3D map flybys of how your family migrated, how they moved around. And we've been experimenting with, if any of you have used Google Earth, you've probably mm. seen the three-dimensional satellite landscapes. I mean, they're absolutely amazing. So we've been experimenting with harnessing those to actually put your family on literally, and then you'll be able to do things like go to a family section and literally see how they moved around the world. Fantastic. So I'm mapping... looking forward to that. All right. Yes. Simon, there's Sorry. so much here. I'm, I just want to pause. 
for a moment and see if there's any other questions, anyone. Just going back earlier in the piece, uh, you showed a Google map and Alfred wanted to know what did you call the Google maps for that time period that you were using? It was one that you put in of the of the hill, the family on the hill. Oh, yeah. You so about Google maps. I'm trying to remember how I found that. But you referred to an RAF archive. Yeah. Can one access that directly? I need to remind myself how I did it. Someone tipped me off that it was there. I'll look back at my notes. I'll have a look for you. It's just there happened to be certain coverage that you can get hold of. Marlene asked, is the image attached to source also not yet released? In one of your articles, you showed sources at the bottom and they had all yeah. these images. And I wondered whether they were just images or whether they're images attached to sources in the facts, so to speak. And I had a quick so, look, but they're not there in the facts. So... No, so there. Right like the no, no, no. It was right down the bottom. It was actually entitled sources. Yeah. So your heading there is is a title that you've put in, and and these one photo, two photo. How did you put this in? Yeah. Okay. I'll just do it. <laughs> okay. So up here, if I click that little I, add source. So this is ah, what we have. I haven't at seen that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I, I should make a video on this as well. But it, ne it needs improving as well. That's the only thing. I can put free text, so I could just write down some stuff. Like, I found this in a book, blah, blah, blah. Or right. my, my grandfather told me that. I could link to a web page, or I could add a photo. Right. And then I, could, I could choose a photo up. Let's say I chose that one. Yeah. Create source and insert link. So you'll see that's now got a little number. So I'll publish it there. So that... That now has added that as a source, like that. Fabulous. Fabulous. And, Fabulous. and it's at the bottom. What we don't have, which I think it was you're alluding to, which we need, is the ability to have a source field in here to say where that photo came from. Because like you get sources within sources. Within sources. But you could oh, yes. just go... But I put it in the notes. Exactly. You can put it in yeah. the notes. Yeah, put it in the notes. No. I, what I was, was thinking was that under facts for an individual where you look at the source for the fact. Yeah. Yeah. That's that the ability to put in an image there might be quite useful too, which is a random comment. Yes, like so things. that's one. When you go to manage yeah. sources, yeah. if you could actually add a, a graphic, an image into the manage sources options, as well as all the other information that you can add in, that yeah. might be quite useful. That's what that's what I thought you'd done in the article, but now I see it was a different way. It looks like no, so we're going to have to have another session. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's so much more that we want to learn about. We haven't even covered all of the wonderful things that we can do with our documents. So I just want to draw things to a close and point you to the chat again, where I've put in place a link that you can go and join. If you're not yet a member of the We Are Facebook group, go over to the chat and have a look for the link there. And the recording for this session will be on YouTube in both Simon's channel and mine. The links for those are there as well. I just want to find out now and sing out, just unmute and give Simon a round of applause, a real round of applause for a wonderful session today. Thank you so much, Simon. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, I, you. Thank you. A quick question, because we've got this blog coming. I mean, do people blog, want to blog? Do people want to blog? We do. We oh, do, indeed. Yeah. We want to, people follow we want to, We're running in parallel the ability to create embeds, because lots of people have blogs so that mm. you could embed stuff from your archive into an existing blog, because it's a bit, we don't expect people to like abandon blogs they've been running for a long time. But it did seem that a majority of us in family history think of, at least think about blogging. But or when it comes out, feel free to give me feedback on it. I'd be, feedback is so priceless. And yeah. loads of the faces I can see here are so generous with their feedback. I'm like, looking thank for you. the AI generator. Ah, the AI generator. Yeah, hinted well, at it there a few times. Well, that's what that, that's what I mean. I, I won't do it now, but that's what that's what that article here was. I was setting up to do a video. And on... I could see see it on the side there. I was waiting for someone else to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there today. This is something for the whole <laughs> other session. I'm going to make a demo video of the AI stuff. Okay. Other webinars. 
And we've been in touch with the Society of Australian Genealogists and they are going to be contacting Simon to get him on board with one of theirs. So there's another one to look forward to. But I would love (laughs) to bring Simon back in a couple of months' time and do another of these. But I think at this point in time, you know, really wonderful session. We've learned so much in that hour. And if you've got any comments for Simon, add them to the text chat. If you want to save the text chat, go into the three dots at the bottom where you can find all the stuff about the chat and you'll find save chat. Anything else that I've forgotten, Jenny, Simon? No, I don't think so. (laughs) Excellent. All right. So, Simon, your final word and then I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, well, uh, just thank you, and keep please do share stuff you do into the Facebook group because it's really encouraging for people around us to see what other people are doing, and it makes it much more of a sort of shared experience. And this is a journey, you know. We're constantly evolving and doing this, and there's been so much input. When you see what people are doing, it's so encouraging, and you know the things that don't quite work. It's brilliant that you point those out so that we can smooth over the cracks. So, just generally, it's really great thing. I love this whole topic, this area, because you come into touch with so many interesting people who are very generous. So thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you. And we will indeed be sharing it widely. And we are on the journey with you and we'll stay with you, Simon. Thank you, everybody, for taking your time today and joining us for this webinar. We hope there'll be more. Thank you again.